Hi, I'm Candace Michelle, and this is Our Community. You may have heard some of our latest promos on the air talking about watts and watts of power. It's all part of KCIW's move to full power, and here to talk about that with me today are fellow board members Rose Weiss, Doug Hansen, and Tom Bozak. Hello and welcome to the show. Howdy, no board member. Candace. <laughs> How's everybody doing today? It's a beautiful day. It's Great. A beautiful day. It feels like fall, doesn't it? Got to go flying. I mean, uh, oh, you got to go flying, Doug. Yeah. Well, yeah, you're set for the rest of the day then, right? <laughs> yeah, when I walked out this morning, I could, there's just that crispness in the air today that just feels like. Falls are coming. Leaves are beginning to fall up in the hills. Are they? Mm -hmm. Yeah. And of course, dark by 8.30. Dark actually, for all intents and purposes, by 8. It's disturbing. <laughs> <laughs> How about you, Tom? You liking the weather? No, yeah, it's just fine. Yeah. Because no. you don't actually care, right? I don't care. Well, I'm, yeah. I like bad weather, too. Oh, so, there we go. <laughs> <laughs> and Doug raises his hand in yeah, agree. Exactly. Me do. Love. Makes good radio. But you can't exactly fly in bad weather, can you? Sure. Oh. Yeah. Would you would you are God's gift to aviation? Oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> and when I find him, I'll let you know. <laughs> All right. That's pretty funny. <laughs> so let's talk about this whole move to full power, because it's it's a big deal, I think, right? I mean, we started out 10 years ago or so, um, well, basically as just an idea. But we thought that, you know, having a low power station was like a huge step. And it was. <laughs> but moving to full power, even though that was something that, you know, we talked about in some of our strategic planning and stuff, that was really, it was just kind of a faint dream, right, Rose? I mean, you remember that? We were... It, yeah, it, it was a fantastic aspiration. Right. Like something that we thought would be wonderful, but we probably would never be able to attain it. Yeah, I'm not sure if I had any reality on it, you know? Like it was, it was enough that we were actually on the air and right well among other things the fcc doesn't hand out permits for full power very often so no it appears to be like once a decade or something um so tom i i think that the move to full power somehow involved you well it involves all of us. <laughs> no, no, no. I mean, in terms of the idea of it, I think it involved you. Well, we sort of set this as a goal in one of our strategic planning sessions, and, you know, it's everyone's goal. So how, how does one go from low power to full power? Well, that's an FCC process, Federal Communications Commission. A lot of people think that, you know, if you want to start a radio station, you start a radio station and you fill out a form and send it to the FCC and they give you a license to broadcast and things like that. Which sounds pretty cut and dried and very not that way not at all. Not so simple. <laughs> and That's it, not the way it happens. Huh? No, no it, it turns out that uh, it's a complicated process and the FCC manages the, the uh, radio frequency spectrum with, with great care. It all started in the early 20th century when it became uh, apparent that anybody just can start a radio station anytime they wanted to at any frequency they wanted to. There, people started to uh, uh, complain about radio stations interfering with each other. So the FCC came into existence, and as you can expect, now in the 21st century, the problem is orders of magnitude. Uh, greater than it was. Right, because their, now there are like his, thousands of states. Right. So, right? Yeah. yeah. So what the situation is, there aren't very many open slots geographically and in terms of uh, frequency or, or channel 
that can be used to start new radio stations. So let me let me ask you a question here. So when you say geographically, you mean actual location-wise. Mm -hmm. So you can't have too many radio stations in one location. But also, you're talking about the spectrum of the airwaves, right? That's correct. This is one reason why now there are so many streaming-only radio stations. Right. They're not radio stations, really. They're internet stations. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. I, for, for example, you can have radio stations broadcasting on the same frequency on New York and California because they won't interfere with each other. Right. But if two stations in California try to do that, they will. Uh, so the FCC has strict a strict process that you have to go th through when you apply for a license to broadcast on our frequency. And there's a substantial amount of analysis that's done ahead of time to make sure that that broadcast doesn't interfere with other broadcasts on that frequency, on adjacent frequencies, and even on second adjacent frequencies, which are two steps away. So that's uh, the process that we had to go through to get our construction permits for our two full power transmitters, one in Brookings and one in Gold Beach. So the the reality is that these windows that the FCC opens up for you to even apply to become a, either a low power station or a full power station they don't happen all the time, right? They're like once a decade or something? It happen, happen infrequently and not on a regular schedule. The FCC is very protective of the spectrum mm -hmm. and typically opens a window for a certain kind of broadcaster. For example, we're called non-commercial educational. Mm -hmm. And they opened a window and that allowed us to apply for, uh, uh, to upgrade from low power, which is what we are now, now 100 watts, to full power. Mm -hmm. The last time they opened that window was about 10 years previously. So, uh, you know, it was an opportunity with a small window, and the next one might come in 10 years or a main. Well, and the windows are so short, too, um, because I noticed that. The next low power window is one week long this fall sometime. Right. It's, one week. You have. Yeah. Well, the window is one week, but, uh -huh. you know, if you're interested in applying, you start that process months ahead. Right. And I've, I've heard little rumblings in the grapevine about that there was going to be a window for a low power station application. Occurs this year. But this year, right? Mm -hmm. But but I don't remember seeing anything official. Did was there a notice sent out by the FCC? Well, through their channels, and you know, oh. if you're not in that loop, you won't see it. Okay, okay. Does somebody need to apply for a low power if we are going to um, surrender our low power at some point? Could they just pick that up? I don't know the answer to that. That's an interesting, yeah. Because we can't have, we can't be full power and low power. So that, right, interesting. I believe that somebody who's qualified mm -hmm. might be able, we might be able to transfer that license to them. Okay. But that means they have to be a nonprofit and a few other right. qualifications like that. So, Rose, was reaching the entire county, was that, was that something that, that KCIW has always wanted to do, and if so, why? Oh, we definitely always wanted to, but like being full power, it was an aspiration, and we weren't sure we could ever get there. Um, it just seemed like an important thing because there was really no community cohesion of this whole community. Everyone has a separate identity, sort of. You know, there's the Brookings city limits, and then just right next door, there's a harbor, which considers itself a whole different ball game, <laughs> And does not want to be associated with Brookings, thank you very much. Exactly. And then there are all kinds of people like me. You know, I live in the hills, and um, 
and you're technically county, but not technically city, right? But but realistically, we can't count on the county for much of anything right. as far as services. In fact, right. even the road I live on is not maintained by the county. It's maintained by a local neighborhood road association. Wow. And we pay dues to it to maintain our own road. Wow. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> you know, I, I was thinking about this the other day because we've got we've got the Port Orford folks and then like 30 miles down the road is Gold Beach. And that's a whole different community. And then 30 miles down the road is Brookings. Mm-hmm. And it's it's like we are kind of islands, you know? We we don't have a lot of there's there's not a lot of communication, there's not a lot of sharing of resources, there's not a lot of you know, right, and that applies to everyday problems too, you know, just public transportation, um all kinds of things that we need to be coordinating, but that's before we even get to the whole question of emergency planning. And we have um, natural disasters that we can expect at least every few years. There are tsunamis, wildfires, and then, of course, the earthquake that we're all afraid of. That's what we know is coming, but we don't want to acknowledge it. Yeah. Right. And uh, frankly, as far as I know, there's no planning by either city or county for a real natural disaster. Yeah, I think the city actually has um, has a plan. Uh, at least that's what I've been told, although I have not seen it, um, nor have I read it. Um, so I'm not really sure, you know, if I, as a, in just a regular citizen, have no idea what it is. Well, and you live within the city limits, right? Yeah, I do. So. I do, yeah. If they have a, a plan, they're certainly not publicizing it. No, they're not sharing the information. <laughs> I know. I know. So, uh, you know, the the reality is that we've got these independent kind of city-states, right, that that there's no real cohesion there. That's and right. So the, the way a radio station might help with that would be publicizing maybe events that are going on in Port Orford so that everybody knows in the county. Right. Uh, Communication of all kinds. Right, right, right. And certainly there are, you know, restaurants and motels and gift shops and, and all of that that are specific to each community that if we knew about them, you know, we might be might be inclined to spend a little bit more time in a different community. Of course, we do have the problem of roads, which usually once a year during the winter, one of one part of the road goes out of the road that connects to the Pacific. So, yeah. So, Doug, you kind of got roped into handling some of the details of the discs move to full power. Yeah. So what? Do you want to talk about it? Tell us what some of that was and, you know, what you've had to kind of undergo. It's a lot of questions. I know, right? Well, when you're a volunteer like me, yeah, you sort of do what needs to be done. And in this case, the process of coordinating with the technical people to, among other things, create a shopping list of hardware necessary to pull this thing off was was the first step. Well, it really was probably one of the most important steps because there's no way to go forward unless you've got the ingredients, right? We're not going to make an omelet without the ingredients. No, absolutely. And uh, this sort of, for me, started in 2021. Mm -hmm. Uh, After a lot of searching, uh, Tom and I secured a, a broadcast engineer who, by the way, lives in Bellingham, Washington. No way. Yeah, no, Bellingham, Washington. So the pandemic really has, you know, changed things a little bit, right? Because the people who live far away and you can't get them here, you do Zoom with now, right? I mean, that's that's what you do. You Zoom. 
We, uh, Tom and I searched and uh, through uh, a, a former student of mine up in Seattle who is a broadcast engineer. Oh, isn't that weird? Uh, we uh, got on a Zoom call, Tom and Jack and myself, and Jack said, I'm sort of busy, but uh, I know a guy up at Bellingham that could probably help you out. And that happened to be Mike Gilbert. Yeah. And, uh, and great so- Great guy. Really, really yeah. great guy. But- uh, yeah, that, that sort of adds a layer onto the logistics uh, of getting him on site he, down here in Little Brookings, Oregon. Because that's a ways. I'm, you know, my daughter comes down for Christmas and yeah. they come from Vancouver, British Columbia. That's a 12 hour drive. And so for him, it was 10. So it's yeah. all every bit uh, of a, an entire day. And, you yeah. know, he, so he and his wife come down, but they come down. All paid by proceeds that we gather uh, here at KCIW, and those are from listener donations. By yep. the way, thank you, listeners. Yes, thank you. Uh, we managed to put the pieces together on paper, at least for the project. And then in December of 2022, I was able to accompany the broadcast engineer Mike and the tower climber Brent uh, on an initial visit to both the Brookings site uh, up in Harbor Hills, uh, Hill, and. Um, up to Gold Beach, uh, to Grizzly Mountain. Uh, and uh, Grizzly describes more than the mountain. <laughs> Grizzly describes the road. The uh, road, and, the terrain. <laughs> but unfortunately, in the summer of 22, we weren't able to get the keys to the lock to get into uh, Grizzly Mountain site. Because because it's way up there, it, right? I mean, it's not like it's just, oh, no, just make a right on Fifth Street and go up three blocks. No, 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 no. Oh, but that's how it was. You know, the people that know where it is go, you know, they go to the tree that's bent, not the one that's all, the, you know, and then you make a right turn, but you don't make a hard right. You know, it's sort of this <laughs> kind of thing. And when, when we left the building with the key, I thought, we have a key. Right. But what we don't have is a real hard idea of where we're going. So we started up the hill, became dirt road. And then because uh, our, our tower climber is kind of a burly guy, uh, and he has to go places that oftentimes you, you just don't typically the have to. The rest of us would not. Yeah. So we came around a corner, and there was a tree down across the road, and, and it had blown over in a storm. And by the way, th that day was, was overcast and, and gloomy and wet, and so it wasn't a whole lot of fun. He had to get out. Get his chainsaw, fire it up, and cut the tree apart. No, seriously, he had his chainsaw in his truck. <laughs> no, no kidding. Yeah, and, and, I don't go anywhere without my chainsaw. <laughs> I have a neighbor who travels with his chainsaw in his truck. Yeah. Oh my. Because <laughs> if you drive the back roads around here, it's a really good idea. But it's in rainy season, especially. Wow. Uh, yeah, absolutely. I mean, even my wife Kelly says we need. When we go to Portland. We need to. We need to carry some stuff. You just never know. Chains right. and chainsaws. And yeah, chainsaws, chains, yeah. chainsaws yeah. hatchets. Yeah, no. Yeah. It's, it's, a weak it's, supply of food. Yeah. I know. So we managed, the, the, the three of us managed to get up to the to the site. And, and, and while we were looking, it, it was suggested by one of the engineers that uh, it might need some engineering, that being the tower. Uh, the that was, tower uh, might need some engineering? Yeah, to be certain that the tower could or would support everything attached when the winter storms come along. Oh dear, yeah. So, uh, oh dear, yeah. So, but the tower yeah. would not actually belong to us. The tower belongs to somebody else. The tower belongs to somebody else, and, and uh, so we are, we have been able to secure a verbal nod mm -hmm. uh, by the company to place our antennas and equipment at both the Brookings and Gold Beach sites. So that's good news. So antennas, check. Mm -hmm. Equipment, check. Tower location, check. But in terms of what needs to be done, uh, because as we all know, 100% of our operating expenses for our community station, that being KCIW, is funded by listener donations. Uh, and, and the security, occasional grant. And Thank security, you so much. Yeah. For, well, not, and that for falls on your shoulder. I know. Well, yeah. 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 <laughs> well, we have quite a financial hurdle yet to yeah. jump through to get to the finish line uh, yep. as far as implementing a full power solution. And finally, your question about when, uh, I think is pretty appropriate one. Uh, the closing of the window for completing the project per the FCC is rapidly approaching. Uh, Tom, correct me, but I think that date is the end of 2024? Or do we have longer? Ooh, no, I'm pretty sure it's November. 
the first window closes, which would be the one for the Brookings site uh, to the end of the end of about a year from now, a little over a year from now. Mm -hmm. So, you know, considering this project similar to, as you were saying earlier, building a house, we need a foundational support in the form of financial solutions yep. In, yep. in order to uh, order the equipment. Yep. And then we need to coordinate the technical people who are the builders and, and they have obligations to consider. Uh, we need the weather to cooperate during the construction and fingers crossed that everything is accurate and correct. Uh, we uh, we need to we need to... and we know how that goes, don't we? <laughs> accurate and correct and maybe accurate. Yeah, for accurate, right? yeah. Exactly. You flip the switch on and you keep your fingers crossed and your heart exactly, yeah. exactly, and just hope to God. Well, uh, we have some pretty smart folks. So we we do we do, and and Tom, as you were mentioning, that, so we've got we've got slightly different dates for the completion of the Brookings site and the Gold Beach site, but there there's not a lot, there's not a lot difference. There's maybe a couple of months, two or three months difference. Yeah, yeah. And the reason for the difference is that while we we applied for the two construction permits at the same time. The Brookings one was an easier case, so the FCC approved that pretty quickly. And the other one was more complex. There was a conflict with another application that had to be resolved based on a point system that the FCC uses, and we, we won that competition. But that delayed the process roughly three months. So the... the the thing with going, uh, covering the entire county, what we found was that in order to do that, because of all of the hills that are in between places, is we had to have two different antennas. So we're going to have one in the Harbor Hills, which will cover Brookings and Harbor and go south to probably beyond Crescent City. It's It should be... A, a lot better signal. And then in order to get north, we had to have something put in the hills above Gold Beach. That's the only way that we could get to that part of the population. So what what might have started out looking like, oh, okay, so we'll get one antenna and we'll have one set of, you know, blah, blah, blah. We end up having to double that, basically, and you know, and it's it's a lot. It's just it's it's a lot of money. I mean, we're we're probably looking at somewhere around one hundred and twenty five thousand dollars to get all of the equipment um, and to get it installed, and that would include the emergency backup as well. Um, which, if, if for me, when I think about being able to cover the county, what what plays out in my brain is the Chetco Bar Fire. I distinctly remember in 2017, um, that fire roaring to within five miles of us. And the only way that we had of getting any information was on Facebook, um, and luckily the cell towers weren't down, um, and the firefighters would show up every morning at Freddy's with a piece of paper, you know, hung on the wall where they would tell us what was happening and show us where the fire had increased overnight and and stuff like that. And it was, those were not, um, they, it didn't feel very good to know that that we had no way of communicating with the population, um, half of whom were being, you know, sent on their way because the things were closing down. So, nope, you're going to have to get out of your house now. We're at a level three. You're going to have to evacuate. I remember, Rose, you, you and John, your late husband, came like twice to my house during that time. Yes, and really the first details we knew about the fire were when the sheriff's deputy knocked on our front door one day and said, 
you have to evacuate right this minute. Do not stop to pack a bag. Don't do anything. Um, pick up your driver's license and leave now. Which is crazy. I mean, I mean, imagine that. You don't even know there's a fire and somebody's knocking on your door. Uh, yeah, and because it, it, I don't go to Facebook, I spend a lot of time online, but not on Facebook. Right. So I didn't know anything. Yep, yep, yep. Yeah, and that's not exactly um, a great idea for the population to not know. Right, and of course, there was no shelter set up anyway, but if there had been, we wouldn't have known about it. Um, we didn't know anything about road closures. We just, um, we were shocked when we drove back a day or two later and on Carpenterville Road, we were stopped by a fire department deputies who were stopping all the cars going in that direction to give us information about it. But um, there was no other way to have information about what routes were available. And it's not like there's a lot of them anyway, you know? I mean, the, the thing about living here is that we've got the ocean on one side and the mountains on the other side. And so really the only way we can get in or out of town is 101. And if if that's closed... If there's a rock slide or something, then we're really in trouble. Yeah, I, I remember th reading about the campfire that was uh, that took out the town of Paradise, and um, I think that was the next year. I think that was 2018. So I was already having PTSD, right, because of the Chetco Bar fire it was so scary. Um, but I, there was something like 85 people who died in that fire, which was down to a lack of communication. I mean, they did not know what way to go. And evidently, they were on a road that was overtaken by the fire, and there was no way to communicate. And I'm thinking to myself, okay, everything's down, right? But the one thing that's not down is your radio, right? right? If you can turn on your radio and hear somebody on the radio saying, don't go down that road. I mean, what a difference that would make. Save lives. Yeah, it would. It would absolutely save lives. Yeah. So, Tom, um, you know a fair amount about emergency backup and broadcasting and stuff, right? Well, I didn't <laughs> say I'm... You know more than I do, anything. okay? So that's a fair amount. Okay. So what what kind of a difference will it make to have that kind of ability for us? Well, to understand that, you have to understand, uh, you know, what happens in, a, in an emergency or what could happen and what preparations have already been made. Mm -hmm. um, Curry County currently has something called Everbridge, mm -hmm. which is their go-to system for alerting people about, you know, fires or earthquakes or whatever happens. Okay. Cover Bridge is a system that can send messages to landline phones, cell phones, text messages, and email. Now, if you have a landline phone and your your phone number is in the directory, you're automatically signed up. Oh. Everyone else has to sign up to get these messages. Mm -hmm. And uh, that means that, you know, I... I I don't know what the statistics are, but I'm guessing that most people haven't signed up. Mm -hmm. So that in the case of emergency, most people won't get any emergency messages mm -hmm. through the system that the county is depending on. Many younger people have now, never had a landline. Then, if yeah. you look at past uh, fires, uh, frequently, uh, probably maybe more frequently than not, the cell phone system goes down or becomes overwhelmed and can't be used. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, 
That happened at, at in the fire that hit Paradise. The system collapsed. People didn't know where to go. Some people had headed the wrong way and into the fire instead of away from it and things like that, and lives were lost. Uh, the benefit of broadcast radio is that you don't have to sign up. Almost everyone has a, a radio, whether maybe not in their house, but certainly in their car, so that it, the, the coverage is almost complete. And it doesn't depend on, you know, a communication system that can be affected or effectively destroyed by, by whatever disaster is, earthquake, tsunami, or fire. So that's why, at least, we think it's important to have a system that can broadcast emergency information over the radio. But to make that happen, uh, the radio station or stations that do it need to be prepared. And that means they need to have a way f to get the emergency information from the emergency operation centers to who, who's ever, you know, speaking over the radio. And their broadcast system needs to be robust enough to stand whatever earthquake or, you know, whatever disaster it is. And it needs to have backup power that runs for a sufficient length of time. And in the case of the big one, in the big earthquakes and tsunami, that could be months. Mm -hmm. So... That's kind of our end goal, is to be a radio station that can serve that need. So we basically, KCIW would be kind of a lifeline for the folks out there. Possibly the only lifeline. Yeah, pe people seem to maybe have an idea that radio stations have backup power. That's not a requirement, and very few do. Ooh. So uh, when the power goes out, radio stations that you'll listen to will probably be off the air. So what does backup power look like for those of us who it could be are not technically in generator, batteries, solar, mm -hmm. combination of those things. Mm -hmm. And the idea is to like keep the radio station on the air. Is there a set time or is there I mean, is it for a day or days or weeks? I mean, what's what's the... D depends on your goal. If if you want to, you know, look at their, you know, your typical disaster, a fire, you know, it may be only a relatively short period of time, a couple of weeks. You know, you, you know, we've had fires and know, know how long the critical period lasts. Mm -hmm. If it's the, the big one, uh, earthquake and tsunami could literally be months. We could be cut off from the outside world for an indefinite amount of time. Well, you would think that, I mean, it, and I know people don't actually like to think about it, right, because it's, it's scary and, you know, but you would think that having some way for the three population centers to communicate with each other in this county would be important. It would be possibly life-saving. I mean, if, if we were in the aftermath of a disaster and, and we didn't have a lot of help coming in, we would indeed have to, you know, rely on each other. Mm -hmm. On paper, I believe the... Uh law enforcement agencies can already communicate with each other. Mm -hmm. And I don't know how robust that is in case, you know, the power goes out and, you know, the, there's an earthquake or something. Mm -hmm. But, you know, that's capability is, is sort of there. Um, the problem is, how do you communicate that information with the public in general? Right. I mean, we've got ham radio operators who can communicate from point A to point B, but that doesn't go out to the population in general. That's right. And they have a very robust system, the AMS do, of, of communicating. They, they really think about emergencies and how they can communicate with each other and with the outside world. The missing link is how does that information get to the public? 
Right. How would a person like me know what the ham radio operators yeah. are saying? Exactly. You're not. I'd have no to. way. No, no, you're not going to. None of us would. I mean, un- unless we lived with a ham radio operator or were one ourselves, you know, that we wouldn't know. We'd have no idea. And that's probably critical information that, you know, needs to be public information. I mean, the roads go down. <laughs> you got to know. <laughs> I mean, mm-hmm. you know, if you're. If you want to get from Brookings to the hospital in Gold Beach and the road is out, you need to know that. Well, even on an everyday basis, you know, if there's an earthquake, um, it's not just help that wouldn't be able to get to us. It's all kinds of um, groceries and, you know, foodstuffs, all kinds of supplies. Um, Fred Myers is going to quickly run out of everything. Including prescription drugs? Yes. Oh, yes. Yeah. I mean, that's going to be, that is the real worrisome thing. You know, and particularly, you know, for people who those drugs actually keep them alive. Yeah. That, that's a problem. Mm -hmm. That's a real problem. Yeah. Yeah, it's, it's kind of, it's kind of scary. Um, when you consider all of the uh, implications of no roads and no help and no power, yeah, being fuel, yeah, uh, I don't know how it would happen. I, I, I'm sure they have backup capability, but for how long? And I know. Yeah. we don't know, right? We don't know. And and we have an airport in town, um, but <laughs> I mean. You're you're an instructor and a pilot. You know that airport probably better than just about anybody around. It's designed for small planes. Yeah. So it's not like it's going to be able to move the population somewhere else. No, no. You all know my wife, Kelly. Yes. Yeah. Dog trainer to the stars. Yes. <laughs> I've been instructed that if the big one hits here, that she... Our three dogs, Phoebe, Willie, and Mia, uh, and the pilot, of course. Yeah, of course. <laughs> uh, jump in the airplane and uh, get the heck out. Uh-huh. Seems a bit selfish. No. <laughs> no. But I have my marching orders. <laughs> <laughs> no, really, uh, the Brookings Airport is a very important part of the city's infrastructure. You may not realize, but uh, UPS every day comes in and out of Brookings Airport. And if we don't have the Brookings Airport, we don't have UPS, especially if we don't have any roads. Now, they can go to Gold Beach or they can go down to Crescent City. But in order to take our parcels out and get them back in the next day, yeah, they, they land in the morning and they take off at 3.30 in the afternoon every day. Somehow I did not know that, Doug. Yeah. Yeah. I somehow I did not yeah. know. I you didn't either. Well, you and you will hear them fly over your house every day at three thirty. <laughs> I wonder. That, that won't be me. I thought that was you. It's not. <laughs> Honestly, though, the financial obligation to expand the airport to accommodate a larger aircraft uh, is a daunting task. Mm-hmm. And there, there prior to the pandemic, there was a uh, airport committee uh, that was meeting well, once or twice a month, and I was on that committee for a time. Uh, before, of course, before we got shut in, uh, and there was discussion, but but the cost, as I recall, and I'm not sure. Don't quote me on this. I guess I'm quoting myself that uh, the FAA is is considering uh, helping to fund the airport. Mm-hmm. However, it's a total cost of like ten million dollars to to expand both oh, wow. length and width wow. of the runway, which right. means we have to absorb, or the 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 city with mm-hmm. the airport has to absorb. Uh, perhaps roads th- that are used to access uh, the airport yeah. uh, and extend. How, and if you've been to the airport, you you really don't have anything on either side. There are trees and, and, and the cemetery on the, on, the, on the southeast side, and there's nothing but, but trees and, uh, and hills uh, on the other. And so not, not a lot of options to expand the, wow. the airport. Yeah. So I don't have much in the way of details for that project at, at this point, but in terms of disaster planning, I'm really not really aware of any ongoing effort at the airport. Uh, but uh, thankfully, Calor Life Flight, uh, they're based here in Brookings, mm-hmm. as they are in Crescent City as well, and as they are in Gold Beach. But we have a helicopter here. Mm-hmm. And so that's a that, that that's a real gift because we don't need an airport to 
get a helicopter off the or, or a runway to get a helicopter off the ground. Or really, we don't need an airport either. Right. And uh, so those are really capable people. We we just so we really want to support uh, that effort. But but in terms of the airport, I, I have not heard that there's been. Uh, any serious discussion of what we're going to do at the airport in terms of disaster recovery? It, there's only one road in and one road out, and and it's a small road. Yeah. And uh, boy, if there, are, yeah, the, the implications again of of roads down or cracks because of an earthquake, I, we might not even be able to get to the runway. No, I I know, and and there may in fact be a plan, um, but you know, as we. Mentioned earlier, we don't know what it is. Right. We don't know what the plane is. Well, we and those planes are too small, really, to fly in much in the way of supplies, aren't they? Yeah, no. The, there's there's not there's not the kind of support that you would need from uh, from the aircraft that can land in Brookings to to bring that sort of volume of of uh, goods. Now, maybe emergency uh, supplies, but still, it's only a there's only a limited uh, amount of weight you can put in these airplanes to get them over here. So, it, it would be, and we're not more than likely we wouldn't be the only area that would be impacted by this, right? So, nor the most important, I would think. Well, they are to us. We are to us. <laughs> we are to us. Yes, but you know, yeah, but not necessarily to the feds because, quite frankly, the feds would be the ones that would be coming to our rescue, right? And yeah, I'm not. I'm not holding my breath about that. Right. I mean that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's and it's interesting. There was a, a a woman, Monica Ward, who was the emergency operations director for the county, and she was hired. Uh, I'm going to say two years ago or so, um, and she was doing a good job. I thought she was doing a good job. Um, I'd had her on the show doing an interview, and um, she had this plan that um, we weren't supposed to talk about, but it was, a, it was kind of a simulation thing. So we were going to simulate a disaster, and she was setting everybody up so that you're now in a disaster, go. Do what you would do in a disaster. And, and there were specific agencies that had signed up to participate in this. Um, KCIW did. It was, but only Tom and I were allowed to know the details, which, you know, was all very hush hush, right? Because she wanted it to be a surprise, the elements of surprise, so that you actually were putting into practice some kind of an emergency plan. So I, I remember as all of that was, you know, in the planning stages and stuff, and, and we were talking about the things that were important and stuff, we were talking about things like how the supplies were going to get in to the area. And I remember Monica saying, yeah, it's going to be by sea. It's going to be by ocean because they can't possibly land. I mean, just forget about the airport even being usable. Right. Just forget about it. That And the only way in is going to be by the ocean. And it's like, okay, then. Because th that kind of gives it a whole different perspective, doesn't it? It does. You know how traveling by the ocean is not quite as fast as by plane. Not quite, right? Not quite. So it, what, what would have been hours by airplane would be day depending on the weather it could be weeks it would we, be weeks we get yeah some gnarly weather around here. we definitely get some gnarly weather yeah are our ports even prepared for ships that big to bring in well, a, i we, doubt they would be able to get real close i mean at one point they had uh down by chetco point that was hmm. when brookings was being built as a town that was where things got loaded and unloaded. So there was a ramp that went out, a railroad. It wasn't a ramp. It was rails and stuff. Um, you can see the remains of it. If you actually go down it to Jacob Point, you can actually see some of it. Um, so I know that they could get close enough to unload some of that stuff. Of course, that was however many years ago. 
So right, <laughs> it may be different now. Right, it okay. might seem very different now. But yeah, it it seems like it seems like if there is a plan, especially if there's a county wide plan, which which I I got from Monica that there really wasn't much of a plan, which is what she was working on. Um, we certainly don't know what it is if there is a plan, and you would think that as a radio station, certainly we should be privy to what the plan is, if there is a plan. One would think. Yeah. It may be uh, on us. It may, it may, it, not the plan, but the implication, uh, the implication of the plan. I know. It could be, it could know. be something that has to be disseminated. I know. I know. How are we going to know? I I don't know. Radio. It's, yeah, you know, I just don't, I don't know. And if there isn't a plan, if there isn't something in place, then. Okay. Uh, yeah, because I don't, I, I can't make up a plan. I mean, that's why you have an emergency operations director to make up the plan, right? I mean, I guess I'm not going to do it. Okay, everybody run, go to the ocean, jump in. <laughs> I mean, that didn't work in. Maui did it. Sure did. So yeah, we, you know, we're looking at at all kinds of possibilities for disasters and you know other things. And um, I think that this latest Smith River complex fire has again kind of gotten my my little squirrely things moving, right? Because it came. And it's not by any stretch of the imagination over yet, but it it's come fairly close. Yes, it has. And it's closed down 199, which is the only way, well, the only reasonable way to go to the valley, which is where a lot of people's medical and other things are. So, I mean, it's... Mm -hmm. And if we had a... a rock slide or something else come up on 101, we would be sunk. And I think it's inevitable that if if there were a disaster, one or both uh, ways out of town are, are going to be toast. I mean, I guess it all depends on what, what, what kind of a disaster it is, but in an earthquake, yeah, the, I think all those roads would be ruined. And if the earthquake didn't take them out, the tsunami would, because half of that going to the Crescent City is tsunami zone. Right. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. And, you know, things that we take for granted, we, we pick up our phone and we yeah. have access to the World Wide Web and we have access to our friends and family. Um, I don't remember any phone numbers anymore to contact anybody if I lost my phone. But, right. But- where do we go when we have nothing? We, I think people assume there's going to be an internet or there's going to be, oh, there's going to be cell service. Is there? Yeah, exactly. Probably not, actually. You know, I, I, yeah. I think that we talk about this in other areas, about the safety nets that we think are there, we assume are there, we are sure they have to be there. And and they aren't. I mean, they just they aren't. And it sort of sounds a bit like we're um, we're, we're we're sort of well, who well, who is the one who said the sky is falling? You know, who, yes, is, uh, chicken little, chicken little, right? Yeah. So it sounds like we're all doom and gloom. Yeah. But the reality is, somebody's got to think about this. Somebody's got to plan for it. And we have to have we have to have some means of communication. Yeah. And I think that's what KCIW is trying to do. Yeah, is provide that, and, yeah. and it's crucial. Yeah, no, I I I agree, and it's crucial for the for the entire county. I would think. I mean that it's because what affects us. I mean, a, a, an earthquake isn't just gonna affect Brookings. It's gonna affect Curry County. That's so we all need to be basically on the same page. I mean, makes sense. It does. Tom, in terms of um, kind of manning 
a station in a disaster? Like, like how on earth would we do that? Well, it depends on how the emergency broadcast system is configured and designed. Uh, you may need to have somebody adjacent to the transmitter to actually, you know, get the information from a ham radio and then Ooh. read it out over the air. Uh, that's a kind of a clunky way to do it. And as we get into developing system, if we have the opportunity to do that, we, I think we should look at other options to directly connect the uh, emergency operations centers and the county and the cities to the transmitters. Right. I mean, when we were on the city tower um, a few years ago, the nice thing about that was that we were, the radio station was hardwired into their emergency operations center, which was right next to the tower. The Emergency Operations Center was built to withstand just about anything. The tower was built to withstand just about anything. So, um, yeah, we'd actually prototyped a system where, where you, what we called the uh, Emergency Broadcast Workstation, which is basically a computer that would be in the EOC mm -hmm. with a microphone, and somebody could read a message into the microphone that would be recorded and sent to the transmitter in a loop. Uh, that was never implemented. It was prototyped, but right. the city decided not to go that direction. Right, right. So, so here we are um, in the middle of kind of trying to get the full power thing going. Um, we know what the equipment is that we need. We've got the list. Um, it's not a huge list either, as as I recall. It's not that big. No, I mean it's got expensive parts on it. In terms of pieces, no, in terms of dollars. <laughs> yes, yes, yes. But we know approximately, you know, what things we need. We can't order them until we have the money because obviously we can't pay for them. Um, so our, our project here is that we are trying to raise some money. And... The promo, which I think is so cute, watts and watts of money, W-A-T-T-S. <laughs> Very nice play on words. Um, it, it's, it is a lot of money. If you're, if you're looking at the full package, we're looking at about $125,000 more or less. If we take it in chunks, we can do Brookings first, for twenty five, thirty thousand dollars and then move on to do mm -hmm. Gold Beach. But we do have to accomplish all of that by November, December, January of twenty four. January of twenty five. Mm. Right? Tom, that's about that's about yeah, our the Brookings transmitter needs to be transmitting I think around the, the end of next year. Mm -hmm. And the Gold Beach transmitter would be like three months after that. Okay. So, anybody want to talk about what our listeners can do to help us? Raise your consciousness. Send money. Ooh, 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 ooh. Um, anything helps. Uh, when we were moving our antenna from the from the city tower uh, to the tower that we now occupy. Um, as a community, we raised something like $15,000, and that was from individual donations. Mm -hmm. So th that's pretty impressive, uh, and I think we could easily do that again. We do need some funders, obviously, some foundations who can contribute, um, any grant writers out there know of some foundations that might be interested in helping us. Um, I've approached a few and, you know, just haven't gotten any, any feedback yet, but we need all the help that we can possibly get to do this. We need volunteers. We've always needed volunteers. We could certainly use more of them. What areas, what areas would you say that volunteers would be? Uh, everything. Yeah. 
really everything, regardless of what people's talents are or interests are, we can find something for everyone to do. And there's something really uniquely special about community radio. Yes. It's not commercial radio. It's not, you don't listen to ads every 10 minutes. Well, it's real community, yeah. Yeah, yeah, exactly. It is our radio. It's our station. This is the community. It's it's more than a name. It it is the community's radio station. And um, volunteering at this radio station has been a rewarding experience for many, and and I, I speak for them, but but it has no i know and and for several of us especially during the pandemic it gave us a sense mm-hmm. of connection that otherwise we wouldn't have had because we were basically locked down yeah now we still be by zoom don't we <laughs> or board beam. you know why everybody well it's yes. because i don't have to get out of my right. pajamas right. come on people <laughs> And I don't have to drive all the way into town from up in the hills. We're lazy. (laughs) Yeah, yeah. Well, maybe lazy or maybe we just have other things that we want to do, like be out in our yard. I know, right? Yeah, yeah. So what else can can folks help us with? Obviously, sending in donations, um, matching us up with organizations that are looking... I was hoping that we could get FEMA on board somehow because it seems like emergency broadcasting would be right up that alley. Yeah. But I don't have any connections at FEMA. Is anybody else? No connection? No. Do any of our listeners have any FEMA connections? Because just step right up. And if not, go to the KCIW website and donate. You could donate via PayPal. Very easy to do. And uh, you could donate any way that you want to donate. We are we are happy, ready, and willing. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. All right. So we're just about out of time. Happens every single time I do these interviews. Uh, anybody have any last thoughts? Tom, you got any thoughts over there? No. No thoughts. Well, I'm trying to think of some thoughts. Okay, good. (laughs) Tom hates it when I do. (laughs) I would hope that listeners would pass the word to all their friends and neighbors, um, not only about our station, but about uh, emergency preparedness and developing a sense of community so that we can act together to do something. Right, right. Because this community does pull together in disasters. I mean, Chetco Bar Fire, for instance, everybody pulled together. Mm. But it would make it so much easier if we actually knew what we were pulling together over as it was happening. Well, thank you so much for joining me to talk about our future. Having a full power station that covers nearly the entire county sounds like a great tool for stitching communities together that are 30 miles apart and separated by harsh terrain, sharing information about events, resources, and opportunities in good times and in bad. It's a large order, but with our listeners' help, it can be done. I'm Candace Michelle, and this is Our Community.